Hi everyone, I'm Jamie Burris, CEO at Zero the End of Prostate Cancer, and welcome to our Zero Live on PSMA and prostate cancer. So what exactly is PSMA? Um, we will get to that in just a second, but if you have questions as we go through this, um, I wanna remind everyone that you can leave them at the bottom of this Facebook Live, and we'll make sure to get to uh, every one of your questions. I also wanna say thank you to our partner, Progenix, for helping us bring you this um, Zero Live and this great discussion about uh, diagnostics around prostate cancer and putting men on the best treatment pathway going forward. And um, we're gonna be talking about uh, breakthroughs and how, and how to zero out prostate cancer. Now PSMA is prostate specific membrane antigen is what it stands for. And it's a protein that's found predominantly on the surface of prostate cancer cells. And the strategy with that is to use imaging to be able to detect PSMA on the surface of these cells and then look at attaching radioactive elements to PSMA to kill those cancer cells. And to tell us all about that, uh, I would love to introduce you to Dr. Robert Bridwell. He is an army veteran, a doctor of nuclear medicine with a specialization in oncology. And he is the former chief of nuclear medicine and the director of pet and cat scan services at Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, DC. He's also assisted over 350 imaging centers and trained more than 600 radiologists in the United States and the United Kingdom. Dr. Bridwell, thanks for joining me today. How are you? Thanks, Jamie. I'm very good to be here. Great, great to have you. Um, so take, take us through it. Did I, um, did I butcher all that, what I just said about PSMA? <laughs> or, or tell us about it. What, what are the... No, that was wonderful. In fact, uh, in fact, I don't even know if I need to do the lecture now. So, uh, <laughs> so I mean, this is a targeting prostate cancer. As we know, one in nine men in their lifetime will experience prostate cancer. There'll be about 200,000 that um, will develop the disease this year. And we have about 3.1 million uh, patients out there that are living with a history of prostate cancer. We really have two unmet needs in um, with respect to imaging prostate cancer. Uh, one is in staging uh, clinically uh, intermediate to high risk populations of patients. Uh, we use CT bone scan uh, now, and we need more sensitive tools to uh, to stage patients appropriately so we can design therapeutic interventions that are tailored based on the true stage of their disease. Uh, we also know that uh, prostate cancer is a salvageable malignancy, meaning patients that have previously undergone therapy for cure, about 30 to 50% of those patients experience a biochemical recurrence in follow-up. And in those uh, patients with a biochemical failure, there's a sub-cohort of those patients that still can be cured um, if we can uh, risk stratify them appropriately. So we need really good diagnostic tools from a staging, but also that biochemically recurrent uh, cohort of patients um, to find the disease, to find the patients that can uh, undergo salvage therapy and get the um, most benefit benefit from that type of intervention. That's right. You were talking about some of the statistics around prostate cancer, and it's also uh, a man dies from prostate cancer every 16 minutes you know, in, in, the, in the United States. Uh, but there is hope through this kind of, um, this kind of technology. And so how does it, um, how does it re re relate to, um, to prostate cancer and serve as uh, a biomarker for prostate cancer on being able to determine if this is really the, the, the right course of action for, for a patient. Right, so uh, prostate-specific membrane antigen is actually found on normal prostate cancer cells, uh, but when prostate cancer evolves into a malignancy, um, it's upregulated relative to the normal prostate, and it is a biomarker for the aggressiveness of the type of prostate cancer that we're uh, imaging. So those patients with the most ag aggressive prostate cancers have overexpression of this prostate-specific membrane antigen to a higher degree than patients with lower-grade uh, tumors. Um, there is some correlation with PSA that we uh, detect in the blood uh, to the uh, prostate-specific membrane antigen. PSA, as we know, is really an organ-specific biomarker. Uh, prostate-specific membrane antigen is actually expressed on the prostate cancer themselves, um, so that if we could target that, uh, both from a diagnostic and a therapeutic uh, perspective, we could actually image prostate cancer very sensitively, uh, but also potentially deliver therapy to the surface of the tumor itself. Yeah, that, that's, that's incredible. You, I can imagine 
everyone who's watching this zero live right now uh, may be asking, okay, what, what's the sort of threshold for, I think you said aggressive disease versus non-aggressive disease of instituting it. Where is that? How do you know if uh, you fall into that, that stage of, um, uh, of having to look at um, uh, undergoing PSMA? Yeah, so when we look at initial staging, uh, utilizing the PSMA um, radio pharmaceuticals, uh, one, it's really for that uh, group grade four and five is where the studies have been done. Um, those tend to be the more uh, aggressive malignancies and they overexpress PSMA to a higher degree so that we can ex see them with an external imaging device. Any patient with a biochemical failure, um, just because they're failing and they have recurrent disease uh, would um, classify into that more aggressive uh, subtype of prostate that we can actually visualize with uh, PSMA uh, imaging agents. The sensitivity of the test, so sensitivity of any examination is if we take a cohort of known patients that have known disease, how many times does a test say that they have disease? The sensitivity of PSMA imaging is directly correlated um, to the uh, PSA at the time, at least in the biochemical recurrent cohort of patients. So the higher the PSA, the higher the sensitivity to detect that disease uh, non-invasively with this type of imaging tool. Great. Now, now, could you share a bit about how imaging for prostate cancer uses the PSMA for diagnostics? For example, how does it compare to some of the conventional imaging that's going on right now, such as an MRI or an Oximin scan, uh, PET scan, CAT scan? Sure. So um, with respect to uh, PSMA imaging, this is a, a PET-CT radiopharmaceutical that we're actually injecting into patients. Uh, so we put a radioactive tag that is the positron emitter that allows us to detect it with a PET-CT scanner, uh, but it goes into the body and attaches to the uh, prostate-specific membrane antigen on the surface of the prostate cancer. It then is internalized within the cell, and so uh, we get more accumulation over time, so we get better detection detectability rates of cancer across time. So there's an injection and then we wait a period of time before we take the pictures. When you compare it to CT and bone scan, uh, we're able to find disease within normal size structures. So we're a more sensitive uh, technology than a CT scan because CT scans basically look at um, altered anatomy um, before they call something abnormal. Here, we're able to see disease within the normal size structure. So we're gonna be a more sensitive tool than CT. In, with respect to bone scan, we know the bone has to respond to the, breast, to the uh, prostate cancer before it becomes abnormal on the bone scan. Here we can find disease within a normal bone that hasn't um, evoked that sclerotic uh, focus on the bone scan. So we're gonna be more sensitive than bone scan, more sensitive than CT. Um, when you bring up multiparametric MRI, multiparametric MRI is really a tool to guide biopsy uh, in uh, patients with abnormal PSAs but also can be used for recurrent disease uh, in the pelvis. And again, we're gonna be able to, to look systemically across the whole body uh, with this tool. So there may be some synergy between multiparametric MRI and PSMA imaging in uh, the biochemical recurrent uh, patient population. Um, Axiomen you mentioned, which is uh, flucyclovine, which is another PET-CT uh, radiopharmaceutical that's available now in the United States. It is a um, essentially a synthetic amino acid that goes to slow growing tumor types. So it's not specific for prostate cancer. And in head-to-head -head comparison studies between PSMA and Axiomen studies, we're about 50% um, more sensitive in that low PSA cohort, specifically in that biochemical failure patient population. So in some recent articles, um, you have about a 50% detectability rate with PSMA below a PSA of two. And uh, with the Axman uh, study, you only have about a 26% uh, positivity rate in that population. So more sensitive in the lower uh, volume of disease patient population. So maybe able to be able to detect the prostate cancer or prostate cancer recurrence um, over some of the other scans uh, when it happens. Correct. You'll get you'll get more normal more normal scans with CT bone scan, and this will be added and find the disease uh, in a cohort of those patients with a normal Axman multiparametric MRI or CT bone scan. Okay. And now, who who's the right um, type of patient for for this sort of sort of imaging? 
Um, you, know, you look at um, you know, what's the, the staging of patients we talked about. We talked about that with, um, you know, with uh, staging with patients with high clinical risk, uh, as well as restaging those indiv individuals with um, biochemical or, or clinical failure after uh, definitive initial therapy. But, um, but talk about what, what types of uh, patients should be looking at, at this. It, obviously, is it late stage, but then it's also used for those who may not have undergone treatment as well. Yeah, so the initial approval will be for staging high clinical risk populations. So that's that group grade four or five population of patients that are at high risk for having disease outside their pelvis. And again, we're going to be more sensitive than CT. And then those patients that have a biochemical failure after definitive management, um, do they have disease localized to their pelvis or not? Do you salvage those patients or, or do you send them to the systemic therapy? Um, that will be, uh, again, where most of the data with PSMA imaging is, is, uh, is available. Um, the other cohort, when we start talking about therapy with PSMA, is if the therapies directed with a prostate specific membrane antigen get approved by the FDA, then it'll be important to image the biomarkers on those tumors in advanced prostate cancer patients to make sure that the therapeutics will go to the uh, prostate cancer metastasis that we know about. Um, right now, we don't have the therapies approved. They're still in, uh, in research um, settings, phase three and, and completed phase three. But if, if in fact they do get approved, that will be another in imaging cohort, that advanced prostate cancer patient with known met metastasis. I just think it's so exciting um, if this all comes to fruition of really forging ahead with a whole new pathway to be able to treat prostate in a way that, you, that takes sort of the guessing out of it of uh, being able to use these types of therapies um, where other therapies that are already in the marketplace right now may not work for a patient. Could you provide um, an, an overview of PSMA uh, PET isotopes? Um, including their, their chemical makeup and, and, and the method of, of how they work? Sure. So um, all there basically probably will be three that will come to the United States market. Um, there's one called PSMA 11 that is available widely in Europe and in Australia. It's been in use for many, many years. Um, that will be, uh, that's a renally excreted um, PSMA agent. Um, so we inject it in the patient, it gets attached to the tumor, but the, the, um, the agents that's not attached will get washed out through the kidneys and deposited in the urine and then void it from the background perspective. There's a fluorinated compound called PYL that was proprietary to the United States um, that will uh, is being submitted to the FDA relatively quickly, um, should be in the US market provided everything goes well by this time next year. Um, that is a fluorinated compound. So that's a fluorine 18. Um, that's kind of the mainstay of the PET-CT world, um, meaning that we can produce a lot of it in regional cyclotrons and distribute it widely in the US. And then there's a compound called 1007, which is a hepatically metabolized PSMA agent that will be gallium and or fluorinated. Um, and there's some advantages of having hepatic metabolism versus renal excretion, because we know we're looking for disease in the pelvis. And if you have a bladder that's full of radioactivity, sometimes it's hard to see the uh, pathological abnormalities next to the bladder. So, um, so there's some theoretical advantage, but in all the research, basically, they all have very, very similar performance. Gotcha. So let's imagine um, if I'm a patient, what kind of experience can I uh, expect going through a PSMA scan? Am I going to ex expect that um, there's going to be a bunch of doctors shrunk up like a 1970s sci-fi movie and injected into me? Is it some other injectable that, that I sort of, sort of feel that sort of itching sensation that goes through your body when you go through um, uh, an MR MRI? Um, what, what happens or what kind of prep time does a patient go through for this? Uh, how long are they sitting in a machine? What's the experience like for the patient? So these are PET-CT uh, radiopharmaceuticals. And as you know, a PET-CT is basically two, um, two imaging systems within one plastic wrapper. They have a CT scan that takes the anatomical picture, and then they have the PET scanner, which detects the radioactivity that we're injecting into the patient. Um, for PSMA imaging, uh, we will inject the patient and then there'll be an uptake time, a time from injection to when we take our picture. 
because of the pathophysiology of what we're actually imaging, we want these radiopharmaceuticals to attach to the cells. They get internalized in the cell and the background washes out. So the longer the waiting time from the time you inject to the time you take your picture, the more sensitive the technology will be in finding the, uh, the cancer. So that may be dependent on what the PSA value that we're looking at or uh, the initial staging, the, group, uh, the grade group that we're evaluating, uh, how long we wait to, before we take that picture. If you're um, having a renally excreted agent, we may take a picture of, of the pelvis very early um, before that bladder has a chance to, to uh, accumulate radiopharmaceutical uh, because we want to preserve the contrast resolution of the pelvis. You also may be asked as a patient to void uh, before your scan so that you can eliminate the radioactivity in your bladder um, you, um, so that, again, we can preserve the accuracy of the examination. Uh, but typically, it's going to be injection anywhere between 60 minutes to two hours afterwards, we'll take a picture uh, of the whole body. And the way the machine works is it takes the CAT scan first and you go through the machine very quickly. And then you come back and you, uh, we take the PET images over the body in one to two minute increments. And then we uh, stitch the whole image together for the physician to interpret it. Here we actually get the anatomy and the physiology together. So we're able to take the CT and then paint the, uh, the functional image, the PSMA image on top of the CT so that we can anatomically localize where the cancer cells are. It's just incredible, incredible science um, to be able to have all of that knowledge at your fingertips as you are able to, to team up with your doctor to fight your prostate cancer. Now tell me, what is a, a theranostic and how does that apply to PSMA um, as the clinical target? Yeah, so very exciting times in American medicine. Um, this is uh, really combining molecular diagnostics to molecular therapy using the same type of vehicle. So if you if you envision um, uh, me having a, a cargo ship and that cargo ship is uh, full of a diagnostic and I can inject cargo ships into patients and those cargo ships know exactly where the cancer cells are so they can go and accumulate within the context of the cancer cell. If we have one cargo ship that has as the diagnostic agent, i.e. the fluorine 18 or the gallium 68, that allows me to image um, the tumor. And then I can take another cargo ship um, and load it up with a radioactive uh, agent that actually goes and destroys cells, inject it into the body. Those cargo ships go find the cells via the PSMA and then actually destroy the cancer cells. So this is the whole concept of finding, fighting it, and then following it all with a similar paradigm and a similar um, uh, protein basically that we inject into patients. We can find it with a diagnostic agent and then subsequently we can um, turn it into a therapy and uh, that component of a diagnostic and a therapy is what's called a theranostic. Gotcha. Now, do you, as an army veteran, do you get in trouble for using ship analogies like that? <laughs> <laughs> I guess, I guess planes would be better. Oh, planes, uh, tanks, but tanks would crawl too quick, too slowly, I think. So <laughs> like, like supercharged uh, <laughs> turbo tanks, maybe. Um, could you describe the, the therapy component of uh, theranostics? Um, that are in uh, development right now regarding um, you know patients. What, what's the what's the experience uh, for them, and what's the, the side effects that they might um, expect going going through that? Right. So if we take the diagnostics that we talked about that are either fluorinated and or connected with gallium 68, those would be the diagnostic radioisotopes that allows us to image it. If we take those tags off and we put a beta emitter on there, a lutetium-177 or an alpha emitter, um, actinium-223, we attach it to the same ligand, we inject it into the patient, that radioactivity is then delivered to the surface of the tumor, internalized, and because it's higher energy, it can actually destroy cancer cells. So the compound that's furthest along is a, a molecule called PSMA-617, and that's been uh, used in Europe in uh, clinical trial settings. And when these clinical trials were done, they take the patients that have failed multiple therapies uh, to get into the clinical trial. So they failed all kinds of uh, chemotherapies and anti uh, 
antiandrogen therapies, um, and they get into the clinical trial and they look at the response to those PSMA agents. And what they've shown in a large cohort of patients is about a 50% uh, response rate in patients that have failed all sorts of other therapies. From a patient perspective, these patients get injected as an outpatient. Um, they have to follow some um, urine contamination um, um, criteria, like uh, flush the uh, toilet twice and um, don't urinate on the floor and watch where they urinate from in, if they dribble and things like that. But basically an outpatient procedure, um, very low risk. And because it's target radi targeted radiotherapy, it really doesn't impact the bone marrow from their platelets or from their white blood cell count. Um, these agents like to go to the salivary glands. So sometimes you can have some pain in your salivary glands associated with the uh, therapies. But if you suck on some candies and you keep your saliva uh, moving, you're going to minimize the risk of those side effects. So very well tolerated, um, very few side effects. And the patients get injected basically monthly uh, for four months um, with these agents. That's great. So, uh, so when we look at um, the Theranostica potential uh, of these agents, um, are, are there any other challenges um, around the diagnostic uh, imaging? Uh, to yeah, I mean, I think I, I think. There are a lot of theranostics in development. Uh, PSMA 617 with the lutetium 177 is the one that's furthest along. It's right now being researched in patients that have failed everything else. But I think you're starting to see clinical trials move it forward either as an adjuvant in high clinical risk patients, uh, patients with early biochemical failures. Um, I think the biggest challenge is, uh, you know, getting getting all the the research completed so that we can get it available to the U.S. market. Um, how we deliver that, who actually delivers it is going to be a challenge, whether it's your urologist or whether it's your radiation oncologist. Um, again, uh, the different makeup of the American healthcare system, that's probably the biggest challenge we have. And we're working on that right now, trying to get the the delivery system prepared to deliver it because we know prostate cancer is a very prevalent malignancy and uh, if these work as well uh, as they do it in their clinical trials, you're going to uh, expect to, to have a lot of patients uh, wanting to get the PSMA therapies. Great. So if we were just sitting down and having a, you know, just a regular conversation and you, know, you, you take your doctor's stethoscope off and you know, your doctor title away, what, what's, um, what do you, what's most exciting? Uh, about this in six months to a year from now or so, what uh, what kind of uh, landscape are we living in uh, in regards to prostate cancer life uh, in, in, a, in, in a way that uh, uh, patients and families can can really understand? What what it, what really excites you looking ahead to the to the to the horizon? Yeah, I mean, I think this gets into the personalization of healthcare that we're starting to see for cancer management. Um, you know, being able to image cancer when it's very, very small, so that when we do our therapeutic interventions, we're we're doing them in appropriate patient populations. We're not trying to salvage patients who have known occult metastatic disease. So we're getting to the point where we're using molecular imaging, molecular therapeutics, um, and we're we're being able to personalize the approach to any particular uh, type of patients using the combination of very sensitive imaging with uh, very, um, you know, targeted molecular therapy. We're seeing this evolve in other types of tumors as well. Uh, prostate cancer is just one of the malignancies that um, the researchers are working on dil diligently to really tailor the type of therapy rather than just saying, oh, well, we assume this, and so we're going to treat you this way. Here, we actually can see the tumors when they're very, very small, and we can tailor the type of therapy on a targeted a molecular level to the uh, therapy and the expression of those uh, cancer cells that we can visualize with the PET-CT imaging device. That's terrific. Yeah, it is exciting. Uh, there, there isn't a, a cookie cutter treatment when it comes to prostate cancer and being able to get as personalized as we can with the medicine uh, and the treatment uh, pathways for each patient, uh, the, the, the better off we are in being able to save lives and get closer to, to ending prostate cancer. Uh, now, you and I talked uh, before we, we got on uh, Facebook and, and did this here live, that anybody who has questions at any time uh, can send them over and we'll be sure to, to send them off to, to Dr. Bridwell. Um, can you think of, can you think of anything else that um, you'd like to share that we may not have, um, have covered, Doc? Yeah, I would just share um, when when the PSMA therapies come come 
uh, about, you actually may get two PET CT scans to determine if the metastatic disease represents the PSMA so that we can give you the therapy. So we're starting to, we see this now in breast cancer with estrogen receptor positive breast cancers, um, but FDG PET CT is really not utilized that much in prostate cancer today, but when we start targeting those advanced patients with uh, PSMA, FDG PET CT may actually also have a role uh, to look at what we call receptor heterogeneity because the patients that benefit most from the PSMA therapies are those patients that 100% of their lesions overexpress the PSMAs. And so by, by combining different met metabolic imaging agents together, you're able to look at, even in the setting of metastatic disease, molecularly how each um, tumor site is actually behaving so that, again, we can maximize the benefit to those injectable therapies. It's exciting. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bergwell. Um, thank you for, for making time today. I know that you're very busy. And uh, thank you for your insights and uh, getting us excited about uh, what the future holds uh, in, in prostate cancer treatment and uh, detection. Uh, Great. Really exciting. I want to remind everybody who's watching that um, it's Prostate Cancer Awareness Month all September long. We're right in the right smack dab in the middle of Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. We have lots of events going on in order to be able to get involved. We need your involvement to help end prostate cancer and spread the word about it, as we said at the outset. Um, one in nine men get prostate cancer. A guy dies from this disease every 16 minutes. Uh, but there's hope because of this great, great research that's going on and these great advancements in personalized medicine. And it can only happen because of you. So please get involved. We have virtual events happening all month long, every weekend. Uh, from a social media standpoint, we have a campaign that's going on right now that's called Monday Myths. What are those like misnomers out there about prostate cancer? On Fridays, we have Friday Facts. That way you can drill down and really know the facts about prostate cancer. So uh, please keep following us on social media. Follow us on Twitter. Follow us on Instagram. Of course, if you're watching this now, you're probably already following us on Facebook. And uh, please go to our website to learn more about it too. It's zerocancer.org. Um, and we also have a, a specialized microsite during right now and during 2020. As we continue to go through coronavirus, you can get timely updates around prostate cancer as we go through COVID, and that's zerocancer.org slash coronavirus. And again, Dr. Bridwell, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, thanks for, for spending time with us today. Great. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye now.